Uh, it's your boy Cody Mack here with What's the Word. I'm here yeah, chilling yeah. with Daniel Booby Gibson. Yes, what's, sir. What's going on with you guys? I ain't nothing, man. Chilling, man. Happy to be in Chicago. Looking forward to getting in tonight. I mean, we happy for you to be here, man. Yes, sir. Uh, you got that hot uh, sweater on, man. You ain't get to uh, look at the weather report for you in. I huh? checked it and then I got a bad update. Somebody <laughs> told me it's a little, somebody from here told me it might be a little chilly, so I thought I was doing something, but it ain't, it ain't too hot yet. I'm all right. I'm making it. All right, man, you repping the wood, that's good. Yes, sir. Yes, you get a chance to check out the documentary? That's what I'm waiting to check out. I mean, check out. I haven't yet, though. Okay. I haven't yet. Right. It's, on the, it's on the agenda, though. Man. So are you a Wu-Tang fan? To a certain extent. I was I was a fan of what they brought to the culture, and that's why I want to watch the documentary, so I really know what was going on behind the scenes. I'm sure it was crazy. Okay. So you from Texas, though, right? Uh, right. Texas boy. Born and raised. Houston, South Park. Uh, so you are you like for real from Texas South or like I'm gonna say it's South Park. So anybody that's watching this interview, they know where South Park hit and they know if if Houston, if that's a real part of Houston. South Park. Alright. So what are some of your biggest inspirations growing up in Houston? Oh man. Rashard Lewis. Mm. He was somebody that um grew up and he went to the league out of high school and was crazy. He actually, he actually dated my sister when he was like in high school. Yeah. And I remember I'm in the seventh, eighth grade, he came to the house and, you know, I tested him. I'm like, I want some, let's play one-on-one. I played one-on-one with him and I did all right. So when I saw him go to the league, I immediately felt like I could go to the league too. So Rashad was probably one of my bigger influences back home. And then when you want to go to the music side, I'm from South Park, like I said, which is Herschelwood is a subdivision in South Park, which is where the key kids from. So that's kind of who I kind of watched do his thing okay. in the city while I was coming up. The uh, rap a lot have any type of influence on you, like Jay Prince and Scarface? The business side, you know okay. what I'm saying? The business side. And then, you know, mob ties, they run the streets out there, you know what I'm saying? So they would come to the game and make sure everything was coke aesthetic. And then as soon as I got into the music, I started writing with a lot of artists from, from that side as well, because mm-hmm. they saw it wasn't a game and I was really serious about my crap. Okay, so shout out to rapper like my boy Black. He run with them. He a good dude. Out there. Yeah, so, Lil Jazz, Lil Jazz Prince. That's yeah. my guy. That's yeah. All right. So music, man. So a lot of people know you from hooping. I know you from hooping. Like mm-hmm. you would just talk with my homegirl May about yeah. the, the Eastern Conference Finals. I remember watching that game. Mm-hmm. I had to be a probably about 16, 17. Right. I remember watching that game. Yeah. And now you a rapper. Like right. t- take us to that transformation. Well, I'm gonna correct you a little bit and I'm gonna say I'm an artist. And okay. the only reason why I like to use the term artist is because rapper feel like it just box you into like making a certain type of music. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so I make all styles of music. I might, I might not sing it, but I'll be able to put up a melody together for somebody that can. You know what I'm saying? So I'm more so a songwriter when it comes to the creative aspect of music. And like, like I told, uh, Mayha, like I write scripts for movies. You know what I'm saying? I write kids books that I go read at my son's school, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? For me, it's just really, like when I hear music or when I got an idea, I just got a real gift of being able to tell that story. Do you ever run into any situations where people not taking you see it? Cause they're like, man, this is, you the basketball player. The whole time, you know what I'm saying? That's something that I got to fight the whole time. But the thing about me is, and it's valid to a certain degree because a lot of NBA players that have tried to do music they ain't really ever been that good at it. So mm-hmm. I get it. But for me, knowing what I'm capable of and knowing my talent, I just put a lot of people to the test. I just said, that's how you feel. Listen to the music and then tell me the same thing after you hear what I'm capable of. And usually that opinion changes. I usually get that opinion before they ever heard a song or they have ever heard me do anything. So now I really understand how somebody in their mind can go from making millions of dollars playing ball to kind of like saying I'm gonna go to stop doing that, to play, to um to make music, which is not how it happened, but that's how a lot of people see it. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I'm just very passionate and serious about what I do. So I just live in the craft and I just create it and whatever come out and whoever love it, they love it. If they don't like it, they don't like it. I'm cool with that. Okay. So who's been guiding you through this process? For starters, myself, but um, Paw has been a big influence on me. Um, okay. When I first dropped my first record, he was like, you know, it's going to be tough because a lot of people, they don't look at athletes as like 
serious artists. Mm-hmm. But he was one of the guys, he was like, but I've seen what you can do. You know what I'm saying? So if you serious about it, just stick with it. Just stay consistent with it and stick with it. And then see that it's, that it's not a game. And that's kind of what's been happening. Mm-hmm. And now it's, it's kind of... I want to say it's now it's kind of more being accepted now because yeah. uh, Dane Lennon, he 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 spent uh, the hometown kid Iman Shepherd he he trying to yeah spend. yeah me and me and Iman was actually set up to do a cipher right after he did that um right after he dropped that babysitter freestyle okay and it kind of went viral like we were set up to do a um cipher which I think we still gonna do because I think it's important for for the culture for us to let people know like. I don't understand why people think that just because you play basketball that you're incapable of doing anything else in life. That's what that's how they treat us basketball players. Like that's where it stops. You need to play basketball and don't do nothing else. And so we're kind of breaking that mold. And I think with, with social media and the way everybody's able to kind of just show all their talents without having to put it through different channels, you can just put it on your page. I think it opened it up for a lot of people to see. It, we gifted out here. A lot of people can do a lot of different things. I mean, if you're growing up in the hood, I mean, if you was a every the rappers was basketball players, the basketball players was rappers. It's like right. it went neck and neck, so I could see it. Like we got guys like Lil Durk. I mean, let's see, I don't know, pay attention to Lil Durk. I seen that. He seemed like he might be the best one out there on, on the basketball side. He got a little game to him. Chris yeah. Brown, another one. Chris yeah, Brown, Chris Brown too. Chris Brown too. Even J Cole. Yeah. Yeah, J. J. Cole got a little game. I've seen J. Cole in the gym with real with, with pros like holding his arm. So that just go to show you that just because they a couple of those guys might have decided to rap, oh, that's all that they can do just because they rap. Or oh, no, it's just us because we play ball, that's all that we can do. Okay. So you talked about uh Iman, right? Yeah. So uh you and Iman going head to head on the track, who gonna have the best verse? <laughs> Who had the best verse? Me, clearly. <laughs> but that depends on your opinion of the music. You know okay. what I'm saying? Like, I'm not one of them guys. Like, I don't put, like, if you, if we hypothetically was picking our top five and you had Biggie here and I had Tupac here, like, I'm not going to say one is better than the other because that's that's your opinion of how you feel about that particular record. I think Iman nice, but I'm nice too. Okay. All right, so top five uh, athletes to do music. Ooh. Man, I'm going to go Shaq number one. Okay. And not just because some of his verses wasn't the greatest, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but Shaq, he had some great moments, but Shaq was an entertainer. And I think Shaq kind of broke, kind of set people up to see, like, that we can do more than mm-hmm. just basketball. And then, you know what I'm saying, you add, oh, slim picking, see what I mean? Uh, I like Dame Lillard, and I like Iman. But it's very hard for me to think of anybody else. I've been listening to um, what's his name? Uh, Alonzo. I ain't rock with Alonzo just yet, just because I ain't really jammed none of his music. But Marvin Bagley, Marvin Bagley, he make music too for okay. the Sacramento Kings. He um, he nice. What about Kobe and AI? I'm not, I'm not finna mention them. Kobe, AI, and Ronald Tess, all the reason me and you are having this conversation right now. <laughs> 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 listening to them rap. Is the reason why I gotta tell you why I gotta ask for permission to do something I'm great at. That's they the reason why. Uh-huh. Kobe especially. <laughs> Rapping in Spanish, he could have left that out. He could have left that part out. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, man. All right. So I wanna uh I wanna kinda uh, dig into your, your hooping career. Mm-hmm. Um now you play for the Cleveland Cavs. Mm-hmm. You know, you play with Coach, Coach Mike Brown. You yes, know sir. You put you play with LeBron James. Yeah. Now, playing next to LeBron James and then watching guys like growing up, watching guys like Kobe and Mike and stuff like that. When they say that LeBron ain't got that in him, that killer in him, like you went to practice with this school, you played with him. Like, yeah. what's your take on this game? It's simple to me. When people talk about killer killers in basketball. They talking about somebody where like they gonna go at your neck and score on you. Mm-hmm. And if it's to win the game, they're gonna take the last shot. They're not passing it to nobody. That's how people equate equate killer. Mm-hmm. When you think about LeBron James, he ain't never been the best shooter per se. So why would he take the last shot? Or why would he be r- coming down the court pulling up every chance he get? Like his game is different. So he gonna kill you by affecting the game. He gonna rebound, he gonna pass, he gonna score, he gonna 
keep his team close and give him a chance to win every night. So I think he'll kill it, but I think the definition of it is just different for people because they just like to see scores, and I don't think Bron is a scorer. So that's kind of why he get the negative side of it. Like he don't hit enough game winners, or he not clutch, or he don't take these shots. LeBron's not a skilled, not he is skilled, but like Kobe and them guys are like precise snipers with their jump shot. Bron not coming like that. So would you take him as one of being the greatest of all time? He's one of them. But you won't put him over Jordan? No, sir. No, okay. sir. No, okay. sir. I can't put him over Jordan. Jordan was Jordan was a different breed, and I think people underestimate he was able to, he was he could pass too. He just didn't. You know what I'm saying? So I don't think Bron can ever catch him, but I do got him above Kobe. A lot okay. of people don't like that. Alright, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with this. Um two, 2007 NBA Finals. Mm-hmm. Y'all got swept. We got it. We got destroyed. We got killed. I, I, I was rooting for y'all this year. <laughs> <laughs> you got to realize we had a lot of people hurt too when we got that. And that's Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, Tony Parker, and they prime. This is when they was like that. Because I remember Tony Parker was doing some stuff I, yeah, I had never seen before. I get you. Mm-hmm. But swell? Think about it. See, we got to the finals. We wasn't supposed to make it to the finals anyway. It was just pretty much Bron. I'm a rookie and everybody else was and the, the, just defensive players. We had a great defensive team. But Larry Hughes got hurt going into the finals. He did. Eric Snow was another one that was hurt going into the finals. And so we got there beat up. We really just wanted, we really wanted to beat Detroit. We hadn't even, we didn't even think about the Spurs and that was a whole different test. But um, yeah, we deserve to get smacked. We deserve to get beat the way that we got beat. But that's just the the Spurs, and I think anybody that that knows basketball, if you gonna get swept, he's probably gonna be by the Spurs or somebody like that with an organization that's gonna come at you the same way every single time. That's why they was at the top for so long. What was the mindset of the team when they first win one? <laughs> Nah, I mean, we was going in there to win the championship. You know what I'm saying? We was riding on a high. But I think it was Bron's first trip to the finals. It might have been his third or fourth year in the NBA. So it was just a lot of stuff that he didn't, hadn't even seen. As far as, like, pop, defensive schemes. I think they still had Bruce Bowen, and we know how, how much he fouled. It was just a it was a different experience for Bron. So I think it was one of the moments that, like, Bron had to go through in order to, to become who we all know and love now. Okay. So now, how you just explained, like, yo, we weren't even supposed to make it to the finals in the team that y'all had. Right. So now, the last time LeBron went to the finals in the situation with J.R. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> we all know good J.R. had Henny in his Gatorade bottle. We all know that. <laughs> nah, I think he made, like, an honest mistake. Okay. I think he made, like, an honest mistake, man. Um, it's a high-pressure moment. And, of course, you're supposed to look at the clock at that time. But we've all... We just wasn't all in the NBA Finals when we did it. But we've all like had that moment. We'd be like, oh shit. You know what I'm saying? He just had it on the biggest stage that you could have it on. Okay. You still got a close relationship with a lot of your teammates? Yeah, yeah. Especially um, Shannon Brown. Um, oh, oh, he from the crib too? Yeah, he from out here. Yeah. Whatever. I actually hit him up about um, about tonight. Um, Shannon Brown is my guy. And uh, LaMarcus and PJ are guys that went to school with me at Texas. So I'm still cool with them. Okay. Yeah. Um, as one of your teammates I want to talk about because I know we just talked about mental health and your mental wellness. Right. Um, Delonte West. Right. What's like, do, you, do y'all ever reach out to him or like, what's like, did, when, did y'all even see him going down this path when y'all were teammates? Well, I mean, right. I seen the pictures and all that and it's like, it's, it's a lot of rumors circulating. So I don't know what's fact or what's fiction. But what I do know is like, being on the team with him and sitting, my locker being next to his, he definitely had like, he was different, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? But we was cool. And so I feel like while he was in the league, he had different, he had people to kind of monitor that and make sure that he was cool. And probably when he stopped playing, he might not have had that. And you know, us in the black community, we don't look at going to get treatment or going to get help as something that, that we should do or something that we need. Mm-hmm. And so it could be a situation like that where he might feel like he's fine, but it's a lot going on. But I, I don't really, want to give too much of an opinion on it solely because like I saw the picture but Red crazy I seen Red pull up 
a lot of ways. So he might have just been chilling and went home and got fresh and they might see him tomorrow and he'd be draped and dripped out. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I had another the streets be with that whole locker room situation, I'm pretty sure y'all heard some stuff when it comes to the Delonte West. More rumors. <laughs> uh, more, more rumors. I wouldn't be a journalist if I wouldn't ask, but you ain't yeah. got to ask it. No, so, I, I answered. That ain't none of that. We never heard none of that in the locker room. None of that was going on in our locker room. Nobody, he wasn't mad at him about nothing. That wasn't a real story inside the locker room. Now, if, as a fact of fiction, no, none of us know. But as far as on the team in the locker room, we ain't seen none of that, hit none of that. So you know what I'm talking I about. I know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> so I ain't, I ain't even gonna get into it. I ain't gonna say it either because that's my guy guy. So, but ultimately, like, in our locker room, I didn't see none of that. Okay. Or I hear none of it, to be true. All right, so we just gonna leave that one. Yeah. That was, that was a big one running around the streets for a minute. They, they say that's why your man's left. I mean, I heard that too, but I also, me being on the team, I, I also, I know why he left. You know what I'm saying? I feel like, I feel like he knew that like D Wade and Boss and all them guys gonna be in Miami and he felt like that was gonna be a good chance for him to go get him a ship. I don't think it had much to do with <laughs> that other situation. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you talked about, uh, injuries and retirement. Like, uh, take us through, like, your mindset, like, uh, cause I'm cool with, like, Eddie Carey's son. And he was talking about, like, yo, he didn't want to play basketball because he didn't want all that stuff to be on his body, like, all that wear and tear on his body. And yeah. You had true. bad injuries, like, what's the mindset of going through retirement? You know what, man? I don't think you can ever be prepared for it as an athlete. It's probably going to be one of the hardest transitions that, every person that's an athlete has to make mm -hmm. solely because if you make it to that level, you've probably been gearing to make a, make it to that, make it to the highest level, whether that's NBA or NFL your whole life. So all you know is basketball, football. And then at one point it's going to end before everybody else is done with their passes in their career. It's going, it stops whether that's 34 for me, it was 28 for somebody else. It might be 36. It's going to stop. Basketball, you can't play forever. And it's a real adjustment that you have to go through. It's almost like, nah, I can't even. I mean, just getting, I want to say just getting out, but that's pretty extreme. But you really have to adjust and learn a whole different way of living. Because everything that you've been doing before that has been so programmed. Like you wake up and you go practice and you go ball and you go do this. And then it's a wrap. And so when that's done, you have to come up with a whole new discipline to be able to get things done. And I think a lot of guys struggle with that when they're done playing because sports before that time was probably your whole life. Um, did you ever find yourself going through some type of depression when you retired? I went through one of the darkest depressions. Because, uh, I mean, I've had moments where I felt like I was lost when I was growing up. But once I, once I broke my foot, and I realized that I might not ever be able to do it again. And like, no matter what I tried to do, I still couldn't do it because I would hurt something else. I think I went into a really dark place because I just didn't want to go out like that as an athlete. I was just like, you work too hard to like go out because of an injury. But the more I said and the more I thought about it, I realized like there's some things in life that you just cannot control. You cannot control some things that happen to you, but you can't control how you bounce back and how you deal with them and where you go from there. And so once I flipped my perspective in my mind as to like, bro, you're capable of a whole lot. Like get off your ass and get out here and get it done. Once I did that and I changed my perspective, the whole world opened back up and I was able to, you know, still play basketball, still be a part of my son's life, still make music, still do all these great things. It's just my head was messed up because I just, I thought everything was over because I lost hope. Mm. So I noticed you said you got a good pen game, right? So outside of music with the pen, do you feel like you're like, because I feel like a lot of young artists and a lot of athletes need to know some of the things that you've been through and things that you experienced. Right. Do you ever see yourself transitioning that into like film? Absolutely, man. I feel like I want to write a lot, a lot of different material that could possibly help somebody or use some of my experiences to to uplift 
and inspire. I feel like that's why I was put on the earth to, to do those things. And so whether that's making up something about, I mean, whether that's writing something about a mental health deal to where somebody can see it and feel like it's possible to make it out or anything. My brain goes everywhere when it comes to that pen, but I definitely want to use that as my platform moving forward to just shed light, man, and show love and um, be inspirational out here. Okay. Um, this is a topic that uh, has kind of been like booming, so I don't want to get, I don't, I just want to get your perspective on, um, cause you was married, correct? Right. So you got married at a young age, right? Too young. Yeah. And I think that's like a thing now is like a lot of men, black men, like, yeah. Uh, it's coming to that we want to get married, yeah. but um, take your time. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> take your time. And the reason why I say that is because I mean, we speaking on black men. We grow up and we see that, and they tell us like you are supposed to get married. This is how you are supposed to do it. Get married, have you, then have your kids, and that's how it's supposed to work out. And so we think that when we get in a relationship, like okay, we gotta make this work, and we gotta marry this one, and we gotta move that way. But it's so much that we got to learn as men, especially around that 21, 22, 25. It's so much that we just got to learn about ourselves as men. We just might not be ready to, even in our in our, in our head, we, we might think, in our heart, we might think, we just might not be ready to be able to manage a house or be with one person. So I just think we just should give ourselves that time to go through whatever we need to go through, learn ourselves, and then decide what, that we're ready for a relationship because I feel like that was pretty much the downfall of mine. I just, I thought I was ready, but I wasn't mm. at all. So what made you come to that conclusion? Like, yo, I'm not even ready for this. Well, it was just like my, I was very immature in my way of thinking. I felt like everything was brought around me, whatever you said don't matter. And like, like my ego was at the forefront and compromising wasn't really what I was trying to do. And I'm trying to control everything. And when you in a relationship with somebody that you're supposed to marry, it's got to be a lot of sacrifice. It got to be a lot of compromise. But I ain't know that. You know what I'm saying? At the time, I'm. It's my third year in the league. You feel me? I'm. We going to the finals. We going to the Eastern Conference Finals every year. So I'm not even thinking about what, um, what nobody else got to say about what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of guys are like that at that age. So I feel like mat- with maturity, you learn to take some of that ego out, and you just we just become better better men. We make more rational decisions. And that's why I say, take your time if you're even thinking about marriage, because um, it's it takes work. It takes work. All right, so I guess the one of the biggest decisions I feel like you have to make in that is, is, to, is to end it. Yeah. Like, what's the mindset behind it? Like, yo, this is not what, what I'm here to do. That was a part of my, part of my depression. You know what I'm saying? Because I grew up with my, parent, my, my father and my mother. And so they stay together for, 30, 40, 50 years. So I'm like, okay, this is how you're supposed to do it. So you be in a situation where you're with somebody and you just keep on trying to make it work, regardless of what's going on, regardless of how they feel about you, regardless of if y'all even that compatible, you just mm-hmm. still try to make it work. But that's definitely <laughs> um, not the way to go about it. Once you get to a point where it's hard to end it, bro. I'm trying to think of the words to say or when you know that it's time for it to be over. It really gets to a point where you start to, if you feel like you're losing yourself, then you gotta get, then you gotta be man enough to say like, this is not for me. Because if you're not at your best as a person, there's no way that you can make them their best best version or love them how they deserve. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I think that's the best advice I got on it. You know what I mean? Okay. It's a tough, tough subject, especially ending it and when to get in it. Cause who knows when you're mature enough or, you know what I mean, if when you're ready to handle it. Okay. You seem like you move with love right now though, man. It seems like everything you do is with love, with grace, with passion. You know what I mean? Man, I was, I really was born that way. Sometimes I ask God why he gave me a heart this big. Cause sometimes some things I don't want to care about and I still do. Mm-hmm. But it, it's in large part why I, why I can come to places like this and, and have great turnouts or why I'm able to have AAU teams back at home and make sure everybody's well taken care of. Like I told you before, I really feel like God put me on this earth to inspire and like uplift and just be that beacon for people. And so that's just how I function. Just everything is love. Like somebody can come at me and tell me how much they hate me or dislike me, 
but they'll never dis they'll never trick me out my position because I'm gonna get them back love because if you don't know me there's no way that you can hate me you hating something about yourself you know what I'm saying and so that's just kind of how I approach everything I just I move in love and when you move like that it kind of like it's contagious and people it's infectious and that's kind of the energy that I take everywhere with me. you feel me <laughs> <laughs> I would end it on no.